One time I was out on a boat on the Ganga, on the Ganges River, in just in Benares, where they call Kashi. And uh, you can get on the boat and they float down the river and you can see the beautiful ghats, the bathing ghats. And it was an incredibly beautiful sunset. Very deep, quiet. And uh, there are these uh, little pujaris who have these tiny little rowboats and they row out after you trying to get you to give them a few rupees to do a puja in the Ganga. So we were sitting there and on our boat floating and a couple of these boats frantically coming after us, you know. And as they got closer, we heard they were playing some music. They had boom boxes. Guess who they were playing? <laughs> Me. Huh? No, I gave him ten rupees to go away. You're here, and uh, your teacher trainees are here, and they have a here at the ashram, and coming all the way from Swami Shivanand, and it, they have a particular way of teaching, uh, which is why I'm amazed they ever invited me in the first place. <laughs> But they seem to keep inviting me, so I just keep my mouth flapping the way it does. You know, I don't really think there's different yogas like bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, karma yoga. There's just life. And basically, we do this, these, we enter onto this path of self-knowledge because it is the knowledge of our true being, our true self-ness. We enter it on for one reason, and one reason only, that our lives as they are, is, are not enough. Just not enough. And they not, may not be bad. There may not be a lot of intense suffering at the moment, but it's just not enough. We want more. And each one of us defines that in our own way, which is why it's so interesting. But the issue is, what are we looking for? And how are we looking for it? Everywhere I go, I mean, I mean people from every, all these different cultures all around the world. Most of them are human beings. And they all want the same thing. Everybody wants to feel good. And each person defines that differently. But I think it can be boiled down to a very simple thing that we want, to, we want to be able to love and we want to be able to feel loved. Without that feeling of connection that we, can, that we call love, this is the time they take a nap. It's okay. It's okay. Without, the, without that feeling of connectedness with our own, with ourself, or others, we might look at it that way, we don't feel very good.
So these practices, they all lead us in the same direction from slightly different, with slightly different techniques. Ultimately, it comes down to one thing. Or, well, a couple of things. There's a w few ways of saying it, but if we cannot allow our minds to slow down, to calm down, to unwind, life is going to continue to be a very stressful situation. All these practices really lead us to that. And just like a blind person trying to describe an elephant, you know that story, right? They take a blind guy to an elephant, he touches the leg, and he said, oh, an elephant's like a tree. And then he touches the nose, the, the trunk, oh, an elephant's like a hose or something like that. Touches the tail, it's like a snake. Touches the side, it's like a wall. So we're all blind. We don't know what we're looking for. We certainly don't know what it looks like because we haven't found it yet. So what we're doing is trying to, you know, it's like we've been born with glasses on, the wrong prescription. <laughs> and through these practices, that prescription self-corrects. And as time goes on, we begin to see things as they are and begin to see ourself as it is. It's not something we have to manufacture. It's not something we have to trick ourselves into feeling. It's not a feeling we have to grab onto and hold on to, squeeze it to death and hope it never leaves, because by that time it's already gone. It's about releasing thoughts, for instance, and being coming back for a second. Back to what? Who cares? Doesn't matter. You don't have to talk about that. But coming back. So when we chant, we repeat these names, we pretend we're paying a little attention, and then we notice we're not. So at that point, we're actually already back. So we, at that moment, we, come, we instruct ourselves and remember that we're actually sitting in a room with 100 people singing, and we come back to the singing until we notice that we're not paying attention. At that moment, we're already back. So what do you do? Get up and watch TV? No. You come back to the chanting again. And you keep reinforcing and re-energizing this, this movement into your true self, into yourself, into your own being. My guru was very unusual. When, uh, one time uh, somebody came from a nearby ashram and Maharaj said, why did you come? And he said, well, I just wanted to see what goes on here, you know, what kind of bhajan, singing practices, whatever goes on. He said, oh, at your place there's a lot of singing. Here it's just ao, kao, jao, which in Hindi means come, eat, go. <laughs> and exactly that's what it was. Everybody who came got a meal, and then as soon as they finished, okay, you can go, pretty much. There were some people who came and spent time, but Maharaj used to say, go away is my mantra. <laughs> we don't have a lot of uh, role models in the West like these great beings, like Swami Shivananda like Maharaji, like Nityananda, like Sai Baba. We don't have those role models here. So it's very hard for us to actually figure out how it's going to be when we finally figure out how it is. So that's why you shouldn't try. You just do your practice and live your life and become a good person. Actually, the reason we do these practices is that so that we can become good human beings. 
After all, who were these great saints? They were in human bodies. They appeared to be human beings just like us. But they were perfect human beings. Beings without any selfishness, without any greed, without any shame, without any fear, without any anger, without any guilt, without any self-centered motive at all, because that self had been recognized as actually non-existent in the first place. So the problem is if we try so hard to realize something, we develop a big ego about doing that. And then that's hard to get rid of. So, that's why I always say just do your practices and live your life and do the best you can. You know, there's really not much uh, else you can do. But within that, everything's possible. Because everything you need, everything we need, is within us already. It's actually who we are. It's, the difficulty is that we keep looking outside for it, when it is already in there, so to speak. We want love, so we grab onto somebody and push their buttons so they'll push our buttons. But then the wiring goes bad and we're on divorce court with Judge Judy. <laughs> so as long as we keep looking outside of ourselves, that's what's going to happen over and over again. And we never seem to learn. It's kind of funny if it wasn't so sad and it didn't hurt so much. We keep making the same mistakes over and over again. I keep creating my little Jewish mother. I married a beautiful, tall, Welsh blonde, and she turned into a little Jewish lady. I don't know how, I, how that happened. It's kind of a mystery, unfortunately. I can turn anybody into a little Jewish lady. Don't start. So, the thing is, we all have these programs that are running, you know, and they're running underneath the radar. I remember when my mother was dying, I had a very difficult relationship with my mother. She was very, uh, she had a lot of damage and she was very angry and she loved me and my sister, no question, but there wasn't a lot of allowing that love to flow. So. She was in the hospital and, and she was pretty much, she was just soon before she died. And she asked me for a, a glass of water, right? And she was lying in bed and she had this, um, you know, little table on, on sitting over her. So as I gave her the water, I kind of bumped the table and she went, rah, rah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a completely morphinated, stoned woman on painkillers and she could still do that to me. And, but in that moment I had this incredible epiphany, right? I was standing there kind of like this. And I said, wait a minute. She's been, she must have been doing this to me before I can actually remember, right? Because I see my grandson, you know, and I see things that happen, he'll never remember them. Not these kind of things, because my daughter would never do that. <laughs> so, but I, I, saw, I saw that she must have been doing that to me before I can remember, right? So I was already in this shape my whole life before I knew what I, that, I, that it was a shape that I got into somehow, you know? I thought it was natural to walk around like this. And it's funny, I saw a picture of me and my sister and my mother at my grandfather's grave, you know? And my mother's standing there like this, and me and my sister are like... 
We're just waiting for that punch, that gut punch. It's, a, it's quite extraordinary. So when we do practice, what we're doing is we're constantly, consistently, and regularly pulling energy away from those programs and bringing ourselves back into the moment for a billionth of a second. Believe me, it's a billionth of a second. And then you're gone again. But the more you keep coming back, the more often you do practice, the more you understand how to let go, what it's all about, where we're heading, those moments become deeper and they become more familiar and eventually those moments of non-programming become home base. And then when something does grab you, it's like, who are you? Go away. So, but right now we don't have a vote. We don't have a vote, period. Forget it, you don't have a vote. When I stub my toe in the morning on the bed, my whole day is ruined. <laughs> I got nothing to say about it. I'm pissed off all day long. There's no vote there. How do we get a vote? And is it possible? What do you, I don't know. Each one of us has to determine whether we really think it's possible or not to get a vote in your life where, you're not, where when we're not just simply reacting all day long. I like this, I don't like this, I like this, I don't like this, I like this. Once again, Maharaji, one time, he was sitting with a group of people and he was looking around and he kept on repeating this line. He goes, tul tul nan nan, tul tul nan nan. Too little, too little, too much, too much. Too little, too little, too much, too much. For about a half an hour. And everybody's just kind of looking at him. And the family said, Baba, what are you doing? He said, this is the way your, people, your people's minds work. Too little, too little, too much, too much. Too little, too little, too much. All day long. We've got this machine that's like constantly analyzing everything in our lives as it comes to us. Too little, too little, too much, too much, too cute, too ugly, too, too fat, too big, too short, too little, you know, everything, all day long. And, based, and it's on automatic. We do not get a vote. So, the reason I'm depressing you like this <laughs> is because somebody has to, goddammit. Because we really have to start, we have to remember we're, at, we're all beginners. We're really at the beginning. You know, you might think that through doing these practices and meditating, you'll start to experience wonderful, blissful states. I hope not. Because you know what? You'll never be able to let go of those. It's too good. And you'll spend like the rest of this life and maybe a thousand other births lost in that kind of bliss. And guess what? When you come down, you'll be the same schmuck you were when you went in. There's a story about a Tibetan Lama who went to Burma, I think it was. And he was being taken on a tour of different monasteries. And he got to one monastery and they said, oh, come let us show you our guru. And he went, oh, yeah? So they walked around the monastery, and there was this big stupa, which is a cement pillar, a huge pillar, right, you know? And the lama said, yeah. He said, our guru is in there. Oh. He said, yes, he went into samadhi, and he didn't come out, so after a couple of years, we just covered him up. And the lama went, oh, too bad. And they were shocked. They thought this was a great thing. They said, what do you mean, too bad? He said, well, he learned how to meditate but he didn't learn how to live. Don't use meditation as a drug. Maybe it's a little cheaper, but it, you have to pay for it in the long run anyway. Don't use these practices like a drug to avoid the way things are. If you don't deal with reality, reality will deal with you. That, my friend Robbie Swoboda says that all the time. We have to learn to look at, at who we, at, at our stuff. It's not that bad. Well, okay. 
might be. But it's worse if you don't look at it, because then it's just pushing us around. And we get no vote. No vote at all. See, when I go to India, everything falls away. I, I don't even know who I am anymore. I just, because when I first went to India, you know, in the old days, there weren't a lot of Westerners there. And the people, they looked at us. They didn't know what we were doing there, you know. And they thought we were all so holy because we came to India to search for God, you know. So they talked to that person, that holy person. They had no idea that I, how depressed, severely depressed, lapsed rock and roller I was. They didn't know who that was, so they never talked to that guy. That guy had nobody to talk to. They only saw us as these, you know, spiritual people. And so for a long time, it was, uh, it took a while for it to get real, you know, for it to get real. Not that it wasn't a good vacation, it was fantastic. Because that, that guy had nobody to talk to. He just went to sleep for a few months and uh, became a holy person for a while. It was a nice role to play. It felt holy. But it wasn't real. It was the sense of shooting yourself up in the air. You know you're going to come down. Better just make little jumps. It doesn't hurt as much. Okay, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, <laughs> don't all leave immediately. But if you want to ask some questions, you can. Anybody raise a hand if you want? There's a gentleman. Or are you just coming to beat me up? Um, hi. Hi. Krishna Das, my name's JR, and I'm practicing a hisma or trying to, so I'm probably not going to beat you up. Okay, good. Um, so I guess sort of as you alluded to, and, and I'm somewhat familiar from other circumstances, you kind of um, had a rock and roll lifestyle, if you will, and... Um, what do you mean, had? Had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that's the word you used, but... Uh, well, okay. Um, and, and I guess I'm just sort of curious, because um, one of the themes that... Um, I find that it's somewhat common for many people who come to a place like this is that um, for one reason or another, as you sort of alluded, life may not be satisfying, there may be challenges, things that occur to us and, and, and sometimes those challenges and that negative energy or that suffering um, can motivate us or propel us to seek change. And I was wondering if, um, I mean I don't want to get too personal, but if you could share um, a little bit about perhaps your journey and as I understand it, there was a, a change that occurred and perhaps some of the impetus for that and, and just sort of how that process went. Thank you. I didn't agree to do that. <laughs> you know, Buddha came out of the jungle and the first thing he said was, monks, there is suffering. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, there's always going to be some dissatisfaction in life. It's built into the process. And without that, we would never seek a deeper reality. We would never seek to remove that suffering. That suffering comes from our own stuff, whatever version of that stuff you have. That's what's creating your unhappiness. And that itself is the impetus for moving more deeply into yourself, for searching for something. I was just an unhappy kid, you know, and I can trace a lot of it back to my family life. But that's just a one lifetime view of it, you know. I mean, there's also why was I born in that family? Why were my parents the way they were? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flow of, of life that goes on, you know. So, but in this life, my family life wasn't very happy. My parents didn't know what it meant to be happy. They didn't find anything real. They didn't think anything real was possible. They had a lot of caring and love for their children, but what I've kind of discovered is that as children, we see ourselves. We develop a, a version of ourselves that 
based on our parents' version of themselves. Not how they see us, but how they see themselves. So I absorbed the way my parents went through life, their position there, their, as they went through life. And it wasn't happy, it wasn't very happy. There wasn't a lot of love in it. There wasn't a lot of uh, peace. There wasn't any satisfaction at all. So I, I very early on, I started looking into, uh, I remember somebody gave me a book on Buddhism and, I, and it said, according to the Buddha, it's up to you to work out your own enlightenment. And anything that would get me away from my parents was a good thing. So I thought, I like that. So uh, that was the beginning of me getting interested in this stuff, you know. Oh, if there was only somewhere to hide. <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be great? I'm not quite finished yet, so it would be great. But there isn't any place to hide. You can pretend there is, but there isn't. And that's a good thing. Because right now, this is our shot. We've got this life, that's all we know about. And this is the time to do something for yourself, for ourselves, is now when we can. Because we're here, and we don't know how long we're going to be here. So this is the time to do it. So there's no reason to go into all the, the lurid details of my uh, life as it was. I'm sure it's all on the internet and in the book. You can read about it. I won't waste any time. But it was that suffering and the intensity of it that, f that forced me to find a way through it, a way to live through it. And somehow or other, I don't know why, I believed that there was a way, even at an early age. And that's a big thing that kind of understanding that there actually is a way out of this, so to speak, is a very wonderful thing to have. Because it doesn't look like that a lot of the time. Yeah. Hi. I uh, really like what you shared about the whole uh, meditation process. And I was just uh, wondering, we had a lovely talk in the morning on meditation and something that caught me when you were talking was how we use anything like this chanting to forget ourselves and even meditation I mean the whole idea is you know to forget that you're not this physical matter that you're something beyond <coughs> so I'm just wondering when it comes to chanting I uh, see let me just say one thing what you just said okay I don't agree with what you just said you know. okay I don't think it's necessary to write signs to yourself saying I am not this physical body First of all, it's the physical body that's seeing the sign. You know, your eyes are perceiving the writing and your brain is understanding it. And uh, so that's like trying to pick yourself up like this. You can't. There's no leverage. You simply let go. Let go of the thought and come back to the object of meditation for a, mil for a minute. And then you're gone again, you come back. It's good to understand these things and, and think, well, maybe that might be true. But you don't know it's true. I don't know it's true. None of us know it's true. We hope it's true. Maybe some of us had a glimpse here and there. But we're all pretty much anchored right here on the earth. And so those kind of aphorisms and those kind of uh, statements are true. But we're not experiencing the reality of that truth. So I don't think it's useful to just replace one thought with another thought. Agreed. Sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, it's complicated. Um, so, I, so maybe I can, this is helpful to, for me to kind of get it then. Um, so when I'm chanting, like what is the intention? I mean, what is it that I'm trying to get to? I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> then why are we doing it? <laughs> so you could find out what the hell you are doing. That's why. I don't have to find out what you're doing. <laughs> okay, why are you doing it? What do I do? Okay. I had a great guru. I have a great guru who loved me more than I could ever love myself, as far as I can see. And when I chant, I try to re-enter that loving presence again and again. That's what I do. And that's why the way I chant is very simple. I don't, I don't uh, <clears throat> imagine anything. I don't visualize anything necessarily, forcefully. I simply repeat the words and pay attention. And stuff happens. Things happen inside. I might feel good, which is good. But I don't dwell on that. I just keep coming back to the sound of the name again and again. You can, oh, if you can let go, you let go. Because when it comes that you can't let go, then you just became God. So keep letting go. Whether you feel good, whether you feel bad, don't push away. This is not pushing away or rejecting. This is the practice of repeating the name, singing, experiencing what's happening, but keeping your attention as some part of your attention on the, the sound of the name all through the evening. And they always, you know, one of the traditional uh, images they give is a village woman who's walking along carrying this huge uh, water pot on her head, right? And she's talking to her friends, and she's nursing her baby, and this and that, and she's doing all this. She, the pot never falls off, because she never forgets it's there. She's not thinking only of the pot and tripping over the, a stick on the, on the ground. She's remembering the pot, balancing, but she's able to do other things. So when we sing, the name is like that water pot. We want to keep it. We want to stay with it. But you'll see, thoughts come, remembrance, remembering things come, fantasies come, this comes, all kinds of stuff comes. That's cool, it's supposed to come. But you just try to stay, a little bit of yourself, stay with that water pot. You won't be able to, but that's okay. That's why they call it practice. It's practice. And little by little, over time, and believe me, it takes time. Spontaneous enlightenment takes millions of births to manifest. So over time, it becomes more natural to have that, to stay with that, with the name as you're doing the practice. Even as, you, even as waves are coming over you and all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of stuff happening, you can still, part of you stays with that. My instructions for meditation have been very simple, and they're always stressed not trying too hard. Not trying to accomplish something too hard. Because it's, it, you just can't do it that way. It doesn't work. All you do is get tense, frustrated, and then you give up. So the biggest moment of meditation is, or practice is doing it sitting down to do it, or standing up to do it, or whatever you do. That's the biggest moment. So then you're already there, so, so try to be there for a while. Try to stay with it. And don't judge. Well, that's like saying don't breathe. All we do is judge. So notice the judging. Because if you're noticing it, you're not a victim of it the same way. It still may get you. But you go, ah, oh boy, I'm judging myself again. Then don't go, why do I always do that? I give you, that's just more bullshit, you know, so. So, that's kind of the way it is. Any more TTs, questions? Just because we'll move on to the rest of the group. There's somebody there. Oh, you don't have to stand oh. up, but it's okay. Hi. Standing now. How do you feel like attached to the language you're using when you're chanting? Like what does that 
mean to you? Since it's obviously not your like growing up culture. Mm -hmm. You know, all these words mean the same thing. You, your own true being. That's what they mean. Who is Rama? What is Shiva? What is Kali? These are, the, you know, first of all, we wouldn't know if we tripped over him in the street, which we do every day. These are the names of our own true being, because everyone has this within us, within us. We all have that. You call it the self, the Atma. You call it God within. Call it presence. Call it Buddha nature. Call it Ram. Call it Shiva. Call it whatever you want. And the thing about these particular names is that what they say, and this is, when I say this is what they say, it means I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but they say that these names came into this world through a being that realized the truth of that, was liberated, and brought that name here for us to use to get to where they they are, so to speak. So these names don't have, a, they do have a storyline in India, of course. Just like Jesus has a storyline in the West and, and all around, the, the, they have a storyline, but the essence of those beings are the same as our essence. It couldn't be any different than that. So the meaning is not necessary to be thinking about when you're practicing. Although some people do teach it that way, because it can help you collect your thoughts and concentrate a little bit. But I choose not to do it that way. Basically because I have, uh, because I'm so depressed I can't figure that anything I could imagine would be any good anyhow. So I don't bother to imagine anything. I just stay with what's here. But whatever works for you is good. You know, if you, if you think of Krishna this way and that inspires your heart, that's good. It helps lubricate your heart and helps, helps you pay attention. But ultimately, the content of the thought will, will vaporize and you'll just be here. You'll become Krishna, so to speak. Although that's a whole philosophical argument that people kill each other over, but we won't get that way today. Okay with that? Is that okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, my question is, you mentioned that when you, um, when you go to India, everything you described as falling away. What advice have you got for us TTCs who are here having an incredibly immersive, intense experience um, when we go back to the reality of our, our homes and families? Don't scream too loud. <laughs> You're going to crash. You know, it's, it's inevitable. Because here, people look at you as a spiritual seeker, someone who's doing practice. Uh, they tend to see more of your basic goodness than your basic nastiness. But as soon as you go back and try to buy gas the first time, you know, the person's going to look at you like you're a piece of shit and you're going to crash. That's what happens. I remember being in Brazil, which is such a wonderful country in many ways. The woman who gave me coffee in the airport just smiled at me and melted me down completely. I got as high, I was high all the way on the plane ride. I finally got to, to immigration. Passport. <laughs> and I crashed, you know. I mean, it's just horrible. But you're, you know, this is, that's what an ashram is for. It's to kind of let that stuff fall off of us, the stuff that we float around in all the time, all day long in our daily lives. It's to let that stuff fall away and give us a little taste of what it's like to be free of that. So it can be very useful when you crash, if you can just, well, you can't, but just enjoy it. Because <laughs> it's going to happen anyway. Might as well enjoy it. It'll just take a few days, and then you kind of forget what it was like to be here, and then everything's OK. <laughs> but the seeds 
have been planted within you by this experience, those seeds will grow as they are taken care of. You know, a seed is planted, but if it's planted on cement and not watered, and it's just going to get blown away. If it's planted in the dirt and not taken care of, it might be okay. If it's planted perfectly in the right place with the right sunlight, it'll grow. So when we come to things like this, seeds are being planted within us by our own efforts, by our own desire to be free. And those seeds will continue to grow. And your life will change without you re recognizing it. You, you don't have to know what's going on. Because if you know, all you do is just a big trip about it. Wow, I'm, I'm feeling so much better these days. And then you go yell at somebody. You know, It doesn't work like that. By doing these practices and by coming to retreats and entering the path as deeply as you can, the way you go through life changes. You may not notice it, but things won't bother you as much the same way. You won't get into the same troubles that you always get in. You won't repeat the same mistakes over and over. But it takes time. It's gradual. Because these things are so programmed in us. Our habits of thought and the way we see ourselves are so deep. There's so many levels of, of uh, unhappiness in there. It it's, takes time. But on the other hand, it's inevitable. There's nothing else happening in the whole universe. Everybody is on this path, one way or another. So that's what they say anyway. All right. So you had a question. Any more TTs? TTCs or whatever you call yourself? Yellow shirts. Okay, I think we have tomorrow too, don't we? I don't know. If you come back. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just reminded, when you met your guru for the last time, when uh, uh, you described in one place where um, you asked him, uh, what do you want me to do? And no, I asked him how I could serve him. I, uh, yes, sorry, yes. Yes, which is a yes, sneaky, right. shitty way of saying, what do you want me to do? Right, yeah. And then... Yeah, and you said, uh, I will sing for you. Is the Not exactly. What's your question? But, so that's, I was reminded. So the question is, when I, um, when I, I first time I saw your a CD in a, in a bookstore, and so I was reading the, where you sang the Hanuman Chalisa and all. So then I read the, the introduction there. So there you, you narrate a little incidents with Swami Chidananda, yeah. where um, yeah. you say that he was, um, that part I actually remember what, what you say there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, unlike the other one, so where you, you went there and you sat down and yeah. tears flew down on your, uh, down your cheeks. Yeah, yeah. And so that was such a powerful uh, story. Mm. Uh, very little, but um, so. I just wanted to know a little more about that, and uh, was that mm. the introduction to the Divine Life Society, Sivan and that, or yeah. when did it happen? Can you tell a little more about that? Well, uh, I was, uh, Swami Satchidananda was the local yogi in New York, and uh, he, I used to go hear him sing, uh, hear him talk, and uh, at the end of his talks he would always go, Hari Om, like this, you know. So I went to a weekend uh, retreat at Ananda Ashram in Monroe, New York, and Swami Satchidananda was there that weekend. And when I went for the afternoon lecture, there was this another Swami sitting next to him that I didn't know, never saw before. And so at the end of the talk, I had my eyes closed. I was expecting the Hari Om, but instead this other Swami starts going, Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram. And it was like, I got plugged into like an electric socket. It was like this. I was kind of shy, so I never asked anybody about who, who was that, right? So this was in the winter. This was in 1968, I think, in the spring. <clears throat> 
Three years later, I'm in the temple with my guru in the mountains of India. And a, a car pulls up and a bunch of swamis fall out of the car and kind of roll into the temple and right into Maharaji's room, right? And I was standing out there and I heard, Shri Ram Jaya Ram, the same Shri Ram. And I went, what is this? Who is this? Who is this? It turned out it was Swami Chitananda, who was the president of the, the Divine Life Society, the successor to Swami Shivananda, and guru brother to Swami Vishnu Devananda. And, that, and the thing was, you see, he, Maharaji used to know knew Shivananda also, and he used to go there often to visit, and they knew each other. And Swami Chitananda also knew Maharaji very well, and he used to come see him and would always sing to him. So he had been singing Sri Ram Jairam to Maharaji before I met him. Sri Ram Jairam Jai Jairam is considered to be Hanuman's mantra, Ram Nam, and Maharaji was a devotee of Hanuman. It's that lineage, that, tr that tradition of Ram and Hanuman. So that's one, that's, that was what shocked me. It was so, um, so powerful. And um, there's a picture somewhere of Swami Chitanan reading uh, my book, Flow of Grace. <laughs> he's, he's very ill. He's just lying in bed, all bone and light, they said. They described him. Like that. And he's sitting there holding the book up like this. It's very sweet. I never met him again after that. I went to see him, but uh, he was too ill to, to uh, take visitors. Uh, so, But I became very friendly with and uh, Swami Vimalananda, who was, who is now the president of the Divine Life Society, and is, uh, was Swami Chitananda's attendant for 40 years. And he's very kind to me, very sweet. And he loves Hanuman, and he always asks me to sing Chalisa. So. And if you don't think I get a kick out of singing at Shivananda Ashram, it's like Swami Central in the universe, you know, and there I am, right? I can't believe it, right? It's amazing. They're very kind to me. They're very, they laugh very sweetly at me. <laughs> it's one o'clock. Y'all. Bye. Thanks for coming. I know you had to, but thanks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Krishna Das. Hi. Could you speak to anything about the tonal qualities within the words? Actually, I can't. You know, I don't really know much about that. Uh, what, to be honest with you, and and not to be too uh, anyway, what you hear, what we hear when I sing is Maharaji's presence. It's not a tonal quality, it's not a physical plane quality, but it's his, he's transmitting his presence uh, to us when we sing. And that's the way I look at it. So I don't really know much, I don't think about how to sing or how to make particular sounds. There is Nad Yoga, which is the yoga of sound, which they, they got all that stuff written out, but I've been too busy singing to pay any attention to it. So I just sing from my heart, you know, and um, that's all I want to do. Sorry. I'm not going to pick, you pick. That way you can get tips. Is there any particular chant that's um, especially suited to sing for someone at the time of their death? Go gently into that good night? I don't know. No, I mean, any of the names are good. The best thing to do is something that they can relate to, you know, that, that, that they feel good about. So it brings good, good feelings to them. Uh, you don't try to bring in, well, I mean, Never mind, but don't, don't try to play rock and roll with somebody who likes classical music, you know, that's they, not going to help them. But any kind of, anything that kind of calms them and makes them 
can relax about the, what the process they're going through is a good thing. Um, you know, I remember a good friend of mine died and I was visiting her and I sang a Chalisa for her and she had been in India with us. And there was another friend of ours sitting at the foot of her bed doing Tibetan mantras, actually reading the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead in Tibetan to her. Now, actually I think that's helpful to her, but not right there. Because the Tibetans believe that when you leave the body, you enter into a, what they call the bardo, which is a dream state. But unlike the nighttime, when you wake up, you can wake up in the morning. There's no body to come back to to wake up at that point. So it's dream after dream after dream. And uh, <clears throat> if you haven't done any practice, you're just blown about by the wind, like the wind. But, so they believe that reciting the Tibetan Book of the Dead, these mantras, will guide you through the bardo. Um, they believe that very strongly, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. But I w that's not how I would approach it. And I think it's probably true, by the way. It's just, I think that would probably be a good thing to do, but but uh, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, where are you? Hi. 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 So um, kind of on that subject, um, I have a little story also, because I have an angry Jewish mom also, although she's not angry anymore because she is deep in dementia. And um, it's made her very happy, and it's made me happy now because she's That's happy. Great. It's, so I take her driving um, when it's nice out. I live in Maine, and we go in the summer. We take we go on drives, and I started playing your CDs in the car, and um, she really likes Hare Krishna, and she starts singing it with me. Great, <laughs> and it's so incredible because she would never do that. <laughs> she just, just never do that, and. Um, it has always brought me a lot of joy and sure. peace, but it's so wonderful to see her at the end of her life that she's, mm -hmm. because of what's going on in her brain, yeah. has forgotten to be angry and can take in this music and chant, and yeah. um, it's a beautiful thing. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, my father was like that. He, he had Alzheimer's, and <clears throat> for the most part, he was very, very happy. He would watch Seinfeld all day long, and same ones over and over again. But whenever my mother was mentioned, the only thing he could re remember was he would go, Sylvia? She was a pain in the ass. <laughs> and then he would start smiling again. <laughs> That's the only thing he could remember about his life. Well, Dementia can be a real gift yeah. at the end. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your, the gift of your music. And I think today in your talk, you shared where that came from, and that's the memory of the love of your guru. And I'm wondering if that's what you're referring to when you say there is a way out because while you said that it's not maybe realistic to be in that blissful state permanently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really do feel at a deep level that that's the gift that you gave, or that you continue to give, and in my own experiences, what helps me return to being in, in the present as well. Mm -hmm. One time, um, it was, uh, Maharaji was, just before he left the body, can you hear me? Did it get softer? Okay. Maybe I just got deafer. Um, just before he left the body, he was sending people away and uh, sending Westerners back to the West. And one of the Westerners said, Baba, I don't want to go. And he said, no, you have to go. Your whole life is waiting for you there. 
And besides, I gave you, the Westerners, more than I gave the Indians. This is an interesting, I don't exactly know what he meant by that. But then he said, I let you love me unconditionally. Who can say that? I let you love me unconditionally. Very few people let anyone love them, even with conditions. This is a completely different thing. He allowed us into the room where love is. He, he opened the doors and let us in as we are. Not the goody-goody version of us. As we are, he loves, loves us that way, as we are. That's what was so extraordinary about it being with him. He didn't need us to change to be different than we are. It's a very rare thing. And only a true being, a true saint, a, a true realized being can transmit that kind of love. And it wasn't between Two things. Love is in between two people. Love is all the time. It's our true nature. And he led us into that place within us where that lives. And so when I sing, I don't sing the memory of that. That's not what I do. I sing to the presence of that right now, right here. And that's all his grace and his blessings. I mean, look at this. I, I don't even believe it, you know. I go to India and I sing there and they love me. Come on. Who's, who's, who's writing this script? It's not, I didn't write this script. It's, I would never be able to imagine the nonsense that's going on in my life. Not in a million years. but I know who's doing it. I was wondering if you could tell us one of your favorite stories or experiences of Mataraji, your guru. You know, uh, it's funny, as I, there's a couple of, there's about three or four books, four books about Maharaji, four or five, maybe six now. And I, I've read them all many, many times. And the stories, a lot of times I don't even know if I was there when things, certain things happened. But, the story I love the most right now is this one. A long time ago, uh, Maharaji was visiting one of his devotees, who was uh, an old man. And that man had a granddaughter who was about eight years old. And she was uh, in the house there. And one day she came running back into the house crying because she had seen at one of the neighbor's houses, someone had died. And it was the first time that this little girl had ever seen anyone who died. And she was crying, crying. And Maharaji was petting her on the head and petting her. See? And he was saying, whatever you want, whatever you want, just ask me, just ask me, whatever you want, right? So this little eight-year-old girl, eight girl looks up at Maharaji and she says, Baba, when I die, bring me back to life. So he didn't say anything. And then, you know, the day went on. So Now this woman grows up, gets married, has children. The grandfather's long gone. She and her husband live in another town. They don't know, they don't, they're not connected to Maharaji anymore. In the, they don't know, they don't follow him, they don't see him. And um, the woman's very, very ill and in fact dying. And the husband calls his wife's father, and he, he says, you know, maybe you should come because she's on the verge of death. And the father's so upset that he goes to his guru, who was, was not Maharaji, another guru. And the guru closes his eyes for a minute, and he says, only Neem Karoli Baba can do this. 
That's Maharaji's name. He said, you pray to him. So the, the girl's father starts praying to Maharaji. Well, this is happening in this town far away. There's a knock on the door of the house. And the husband opens up the door, and there's this bulky gentleman in a blanket. And he says, who are you? He said, I'm Neem Karoli Baba. Your wife is sick? And he says, no, Baba, she's died. Nay, she's not dead. Take me to her. So the husband takes Maharaji into the back room. And he looks at the wife and says, you have any grapes in the house? Bring me a spoon and some grapes. So the husband brings some grapes, and he squeezes the grapes. And with a spoon, he just pours a little of the juice into the woman's mouth. And he says, Tiko Jagna, she'll be okay now. And he leaves, and the woman gets better. This was probably 30 or 40 years after the little girl asked him to bring her back to life. Nobody had to tell him. Nobody had to send a telegram. He showed up. You know, it's easy for me to, un to say, I know he could do that. He was doing that 24-7. But that he would do that. That's the kind of love and compassion he has. He never forgot, not for a second, that he promised that little girl. Without compassion, without love, all the other stuff is shit, plain and simple. All the powers, flying, making yourself small, being able to find treasures, doing all kinds, of, all kinds of powers you can have. It's only going to cause you suffering without love, without compassion for yourself and others. And the way we get that compassion is we start right with ourselves. And we, we try not to be so hard on ourselves. We are our worst enemy. We have no other enemies except our own minds and the programs that are running inside of us. All that is external to who we are. And when we do practice, we move through those places into a deeper place inside of us, which gets reinforced every time you go there, even if it's for a billionth of a second. It plants a seed. It reinforces, it makes a channel to flow deeper over and over again and again. He never told us what to do. He, uh, he made us find our own way. Going back to your, uh, what you said, so it was going to be the last time that I've s s ever seen him in the body so far. And um, I was going back to America. I had been in India for two and a half years because he allowed me to stay. He fixed my visa for me. And uh, what was I going to do? I'd been walking around barefoot in a red dress for a couple of years. I didn't think that was going to work in New York. I didn't know what to do. I, I, just, I had no clue about who I was from a Western point of view anymore. So I wanted him to tell me what to do, but I, I knew it was kind of cheap to ask. So I said, which turned out to be much worse. I said, Baba, how can I serve you in America? Was I really thinking about serving him? No. I wanted him to tell me what to do, God damn it, because I'm scared shitless. I don't know what I'm going to do. He just looked at me and he made this face like, like he bit a pickle, you know? And he said, ah, asking about service, it's not service. And he said, do what you want. Do what you want. Where can you buy a guru who tells you to do what you want? You know? 
Let me go. Tell me, because I'll buy them all. I, that's what I do. What you want? I'd been celibate for three years. Do you know what I wanted to do? <laughs> and he knew. That's the thing. And he looked at me and he cracked up. He said, "So, how will you serve me?" Ah. <laughs> and my mind was going like. It literally stopped. Like, it just. And then I had to go, so I kind of got up. And I walked across the courtyard, and I bowed to him for the last time. And while I was bowing to him, I heard a voice in my head. It was my voice speaking, but it wasn't me speaking. I don't know how to explain that to you. And it said, I'll sing to you in America. And I thought, yeah, OK. That's the way that happened. But. It was 21 years before I began to sing to him in America. 21 years of absolute horror. <laughs> I mean, some of it was fun, but it was horror nonetheless. 21 years until I actually recognized that if I don't sing with people, I will never clean the dark corners and the shadows out of my own heart. There was no, this was it. This was the only thing I had, the only rope that was being thrown to this drowning man. And that's why I started. And it's because that's why I sing, even today. That's exactly why I sing. That's why this works. We, I had been singing a little bit on and off before with people who had been in India, you know, and it was yada yada. It was okay. But it wasn't really singing. It wasn't chanting. It wasn't really doing a practice. It wasn't really being present. It wasn't being real. This was real. So when I sing, Every time I sing, it's exactly the same. I am singing to save my miserable ass. Every time. Every name, every repetition, my life is right there. Sounds dramatic, huh? It's probably bullshit. <laughs> but let's just say, I really try. I try my best every time because Really, uh, my life depends on it. Article on the internet? In Playboy? Yes, yeah. yes. That Playgirl, actually. The, play, no, the um, Playgirl interview <laughs> of Krishna Das. Um, and it was about how you went into a prison in Alabama and played for the inmates. I have, actually, it's funny you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I may be going to Alabama to a prison, but it was in West Virginia. Oh, okay. Or in, Virginia. Well, in, sort of in the South, not quite in the South. But, yeah, um, South enough. South enough. And how um, <laughs> Where the you inmates from? got Where up. Where are you from? Where I'm are you from, from South Carolina. South Carolina. Oh, God. I so, love and I've got an, and I'm, I'm asking this also just from, from my own personal experience, but in the article it said that some of the inmates got up and just walked out when they heard, and I guess because of religious reasons? Actually, I'll tell you, they couldn't walk out because it's a prison. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't even leave the room, you know. But what happened was we were singing, and we were singing Sri Ram, J Ram, a couple of things, and they were kind of into it. The moment I sang Hare Krishna, they all looked at each other and went, oh, that's what this is. And we lost every one of them. They just stopped. They shut down. Because of the, 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 cause of their misunderstanding about what that's all about. And, and, and also the way that they've been exposed to that stuff has been very, uh, left a negative effect for them. So we lost them. That was it. When I sang in the women's prison in Burlington, we didn't sing that. <laughs> we had a great time. It's because growing up in the South, I, 
occasionally will get a message from someone worried about my salvation because of my interest in kirtan and chanting and yoga in general. And I actually have, am going into prisons and teaching in the women's prisons uh-huh. in my state. And right. I've, that's a big concern among some of the inmates. So I was just yeah. wondering how, how you dealt with that, what you do. Do you deal with it? Do you just let it go? It just so happens that's what happened in Burlington. There had been um, maybe 75 of the inmates signed up to come to the chanting. But apparently the day before, somebody started saying that this was all devil worship. And so only like 20 people showed up. What are you going to do? Nothing. Just keep singing. You know, I don't... I don't even think of it as religious myself. I'm not, it's not like I'm trying to hide that from anybody. I, I see it as a very simple um, satanic cult, basically. <laughs> now, let's not put that up on the internet, okay? I, I have to remember these things go these words go out you know they, I don't see it as religious I, spiritual means working on yourself that's what I see, the way I see it You're working on your spirit trying to manifest that and open that up and touch that and as opposed to religious which is part which is an organized uh, religion uh, I'm not a Hindu my guru never initiated me as a Hindu he never you know, he never, he, it wasn't about anything like that. He had devotees from all religions. And he always said, all one. He never said one thing or another. He loved Jesus as much as Hanuman and Christ. He said, they're all the same. You don't have to go saying that to people in South Carolina. <laughs> but you can show them how to stand on their heads and stretch their butts out and do whatever else they have to do, you know. It doesn't have to, you don't have it to lay anything on people. You just have to meet them where they are. You don't have to challenge people. I don't think it's w- useful. Um, there was a friend of mine, a woman who uh, really loved the chanting, so she used to play it in her house. She used to put pictures up all over her house and play me in every room all day long. And her husband was going to leave her. And she asked me what that do. I said, take down the goddamn pictures and turn the music off. <laughs> They're still married. You know? So it's kind of the way it is, you know? And what's real in you is what will be transmitted to what's real in them. You don't have to do anything to anybody. But what you have to offer is, what you, what is who you are. And... and when somebody comes up to you and, and is worried about your salvation, uh, you say, isn't that nice? <laughs> I think we were in South Carolina when I was, we stopped for a cup of coffee, and, uh, and uh, there was a beautiful woman at, at the counter serving us, and I was telling a dirty joke to my friend, and I didn't realize she heard me, so I apologized. She said, oh, that's all right. My grandmother told me how to say fuck you. <laughs> and I said, Really? How do you say it? Isn't that nice? (laughs) The South is a very cool place. Really very cool. What are you teaching in the prisons? Asanas? Asanas? Yeah. Just call it physical, physical exercise, you know. Don't, don't worry about it. And whatever they say, if, if it gets to you, then you have work to do, and you certainly don't have anything to teach anybody. It's just people's fear. It's just people's fear. They're afraid. They're afraid. They know, not only do they not know what, what or where heaven is, what their own soul and their own being is in the first place. They're just afraid. You know, it's just crazy fear. It's insanity, what most religion in this world. I mean, look around. Is there anything sane about any of it? Very little. Very little. So, that's why the Dalai Lama says, my religion is love. 
You know, that's the only thing that people really respond to. If you're trying to teach them something or make them change or make them accept something, you don't know enough. We don't know enough. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a similar subject, but um, could you comment on your experience of Western secular music since you became a devotee? Western, like what? What's, what is Western secular music? What do you mean? Like popular music. Like, do you find like a deeper spirituality when you listen to Van Morrison now than before you left? Or no, uh, he was always pretty spiritual. Yeah. Nah, but uh, I like music. I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, everybody has a right to be happy in their own way, you know, and to express themselves their own way. Um, I don't think what I do is any better than what anybody else does. I don't, you know, it's just a little different, different attitude, and it's also not expression. I mean, most music is some kind of expression, where they're they're trying to express themselves artistically. I I, I failed at that already, so now I just chant. <laughs> you know, and I don't. I'm not. It's not entertainment. You know. Popular music and entertainment wants to entertain you and get you off so you'll buy more CDs. I'm trying to find that love again every time I chant. I'm not trying to make anything happen for you. If I was trying to make something happen for you, it would never happen. Not that it does. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But I'm simply just sharing my practice. But I love music. I, anything, I, anything I love, I love. You know. I don't know if I like Gangnam style very much, but <laughs> but I like uh, the Macarena. I like. <laughs> Everybody's cool. You know, they're all doing their own thing. Uh, every generation thinks that they grew up with the best music. You know, my my parents thought that swing bands and jazz was the best music and you know it's obvious that the Beatles and the Stones were the best music but you know I don't have to try to convince them of that Van Morrison, Steely Dan, Ray Charles you know come on the gods of music right everybody else is just I'm just kidding but you know I'm not sure what was that what were you actually asking about Um, who you're into, but uh, you know, I wanted, I also want to know if they, if if things stood out more to you once you became uh, more spiritually aware. I think that was kind of the direction I was leaning. Thank you for thinking I'm spiritually aware. Uh, I don't know. I think I just I just if some if I like something I like something. I don't really think about it. It, the answer is it didn't stick out. I was already very much into music, you know, always have been. Uh, so, I'm sorry I can't do better. But I'm not very spiritually aware. <laughs> Hello, and uh, thank you for what you do. You inspire me a lot. Oh. <laughs> Over here. Uh, so my question is to build off of uh, the last question. On the, previous, on the new album, you do a, a chant over Towns Van Zandt's Poncho and Lefty's Melody. Do and, I? Yes. Which and one is that? I'm not sure. About a year ago, you played in New York, and you did it, uh, the chant over Towns Van Zandt's music. Well, I sing, I sing Poncho and Lefty at, at uh, sound checks all the time, but I don't think it's exactly the same chords. And if it is, it wasn't on purpose. But well, go ahead. So, so my question is, uh, why Towns Van Zandt, and what's your experience with his music? Did anybody, how many people actually know who Towns Van Zandt is? Good, that's more than two. Um, Towns Van Zandt is a Texas uh, singer-songwriter. He died some years ago. He was an extraordinary songwriter. Uh, one of the greatest in, in, in that, uh, that era of, of songwriting. And uh, he wrote some beautiful songs, really deep beautiful songs and I, I like 
him a lot. There's a, there's a movie about him called uh, Be Here to Love Me, I think it's called. And it's just heartbreaking. The guy, it's heartbreaking. It, he is a real sad, unhappy, depressed, probably psychologically damaged being, but he wrote some beautiful songs. And obviously, since I love depression so much, I can't get enough of them. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do a lot of crazy stuff at Soundcheck. That's one. I think uh, I don't think it's exactly the same chords, but so yeah. I mean, I don't just in general. I don't really think so much about the melodies that come out. They just come out, and I sing them. And if somebody else likes them, that's good. But, uh, if not, there's nothing I can do. So somebody, okay, there's a yellow shirt over there. Oh, okay, two more. Okay. Turn it on. The power of the microphone. Yes. Um, I tend to put myself in your position and. God what forbid. <laughs> What would I do if I had had your experience of being in the presence of um, someone so advanced? And it would be very difficult for me not to try to emulate that and um, aspire to that same level of enlightenment. I don't, I don't look good in a blanket, <laughs> you know? Go ahead, sorry. That's okay. Uh, you don't seem to go that route. And I'm just wondering, you know, was that a temptation for you, or is it ever still a temptation to try to emulate your guru, or is that not, does that not even cross your mind? Emulate in what way? Not own anything, sit around on a, on a, on a wood cot, uh, walk barefoot through the mountains of India in the freezing cold. Uh, have nothing, own nothing, except being the whole universe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the last part of it I'd like to emulate. But but I'm not sure what you mean. Like become a, 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 a baba? Or what, what, I don't know well, what you mean. Maybe, let me ask the question this way. Okay. In, in what way do you try to emulate your guru? I try to enter into that loving presence and live in that loving presence as much as I can. That's the real guru, is that love. Not, not the baba, with, not the body, not the blanket, not, not the cute little smile and the pat on the head. That's, that's the being in there, the love in there is the guru. So that's, I do try to emulate that as much as I can, but not externally, that's not, that's not it at all. Om Namah Shivaya. Same to you. Um, I'm, uh, you seem so sad. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm happy. Okay, good. <laughs> I just wanted to check on that first. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is, um, last night in your opening comments, you mentioned a recent place you played and the amount of people that um, wanted to come and express their love and yeah. so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And mm -hmm. I think that most of us here and all over the place would agree that there's an undeniable shift right now, beginning, whatever you want to call it, um, gradually moving into lighter space. Okay. Um, my question is the following. I've always believed in the healing power of music, singing it, dancing to it listening to it, and so on and so forth. And um, as a accomplished musician, musical group, what role do you see music playing in the future of this shift? You know, if music was enough, every musician would be God and would be happy. And you know that's not the case. So what we're doing involves music, but in a different way. Music, you know, when a kid is sick, you have to put the medicine in a sweet syrup so that they'll take the medicine. The sweet syrup lets them take the medicine, but the medicine is the name. 
It's the repetition of the name that is planting the seeds within us of reality, so to speak, not the music. The music makes it easier to take the medicine. But with, without the music, the same thing would happen. But music helps us pay attention, which is important. It, if we're in a room singing, you're hearing the name, which is also very important, as well as speaking or singing the name. Through the whole night, you'll be hearing the name, even if you're not even really paying attention. It's still going in there. So this is part of the, the mystical kind of stuff about the practice of the name. The name is a very special practice, you know. It, it's beyond, it's very deep, very, very deep. Um, there are m mantras are mantras, but the name is, is the, in the beginning was the word. That's where it starts. So that's before anything is the name. And that name is silence. There's a thing that from St. John of the Cross, was it? That uh, in the beginning the Father uttered one word. That word is his Son. And he utters him forever in everlasting silence. And it is in silence that the heart must hear. The name is silence. It means it's beyond thought. It's not the suppression of thought or holding on to ram, 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 and not thinking about anything else ever. No. It's much deeper than all that. And by doing these practices, we're planting the seeds that will grow. And from within, we will understand and experience what what this is all about. The name is our true being. The name is not the names, like Shiva, Kali, all those are names, but name, or nam, is being. It's the first into form. In the beginning was name. Everything comes from that. So by repeating these names, we're kind of channeling ourselves into this place of name, of Nam, which is our true nature. Your true nature, my true nature, their true nature, everybody's. And music helps us do that. It soothes the savage beast. But when it goes off, the beast goes and eats somebody else. So it's only through the fact that there's medicine in the, in the music, which is the name, that plants the real, that cures us ultimately of, you could say, the illusion that we're a separate being. Because it's from that feeling of separateness that all our suffering comes, all our experience comes from we think we are who we think we are. So the name brings us more deeper than that level. And the music helps us pay attention, and it helps us open up, and it helps the name go deeper. But uh, music itself can be used for anything. Like Rick Rubin, who produced two of my CDs. You know who he did after my second CD, the next? Slipknot. <laughs> he went from Krishna Das to Slipknot in about 30 seconds. So, hello. Music, music is what it is, and it's not, and it's what it isn't as well, you know, so. Okay, we're finished. So, uh, stop. thank you. I have to say thank you. But, but you don't have to do that. So, um, we'll take a little break and then Nina's going to start with Chalisa's at two. See you later. Ah. Uh -huh.
Yeah.